Hey, we have some exciting news to share. We have written a book, Polarity, Intelligence, The Missing Logic and Leadership, and it is now available for pre-order on Amazon. Just search for the title of our book, Polarity, Intelligence, The Missing Logic and Leadership, and pre-order your copy today. As listeners of our podcast, you know we have been using the principles of a polarity mindset, healthy relationships, and meaningful dialogue as leaders for decades. And as business partners, these principles are the cornerstone of our business. Polarities are all around us, even in us, and if you can't recognize them and don't know how to leverage them, they will haunt you. They will keep showing up as persistent problems you are unable to solve. For us, having this knowledge compels us to share it with leaders around the world. We believe the polarization in our homes, schools, communities, and world would shift if every leader became polarity intelligent. We can't wait for you to read our book. Pre-order your copy of Polarity Intelligence, The Missing Logic and Leadership on Amazon.com now. This is Healthcare's Missing Logic Podcast, episode number 229. This is the last of the encore episodes before the big reveal. And this one is from Workplace Drama to Workforce Empowerment with David Emerald Wommeldorf. And what a wonderful, lovely man. This is one of our favorite episodes, one of our favorite interviews. What David has brought to the world, oh my goodness, is so highly valuable. His um, book, The Empowerment Dynamic and Three Vital Questions. We've been living these. Not, I wouldn't say mastering them because this is a journey, folks. It is. But we've been practicing this for many, many years. <laughs> the concepts, the techniques, seems like forever we've been doing this. And just so grateful for David's gifts to the world and our ability to learn from them. And, um, you know, when you're, I think, you know, when you're dealing with a polarity or in the middle of a polarity, trying to leverage it or manage it, and you're sitting in the downside of a pole that's been (laughs) overemphasized, it's pretty easy to slip into the victim orientation and to start to feel like everything's happening, you know, to you, right, against you. And, uh, And I've known also, in my experience as a leader, it can be really easy to slip into a rescuer mode as well. <laughs> and these are a couple of things that you'll learn about in our interview with David and the balance, right, of uh, of these things and uh, and just how to manage them and how to move through them. And and they it happens. It just happens. And you got to recognize where you're at and what you're doing. And there's just so many, so many great lessons in this episode for leaders overall. Um, and I think another one that I would just call attention to is where you're putting your attention and, uh, and the impact that that can have on the results that you experience, um, what you feel. And, uh, and, you know, I think it's, uh, it's a question that I have adopted for the year is where's my attention? Where's my attention? Where's my intention? <laughs> just to be intentional about where I've got my attention. <laughs> Yeah, we're so grateful for David's wisdom and for him being a guest on our podcast. And he's also given us a couple other gifts since we recorded this podcast, one of which was because of his episode, it connected us to two new listeners, uh, Corey McMahon and Kelly Martin, who also follow David's work. And we've ended up being really colleagues with them, and they actually were on our podcast, uh, episode 216, and have really become committed to being polarity intelligent leaders. And then we also asked David to write an endorsement for up, our upcoming book, Polarity Intelligence, The Missing Logic and Leadership, and he graciously accepted to do that. So we thought we also would share with you David's endorsement in our upcoming book before we turn it over to our awesome interview with David. And uh, he was very humbled. He said, there are so many things I love about this new leadership book by Dr. Tracy Christofferson and Michelle Trosett. Their ability to describe the dynamic balance that needs to be leveraged and managed between two interdependent poles and how the invisible energy actually works between them is a critical is critical for all leaders to grasp. 
No one can agree more than me that tension is good if you know how to work with it. The principles and skills of healthy relationships and meaningful dialogue, along with the polarity mindset, are essential for a healthy for healthy work cultures in all venues of work. So thank you, David, for being the guest on our podcast and for your gifts that just keep on giving and keep listening to our interview. Welcome back to Healthcare's Missing Logic Podcast. This is the only podcast that shows you how to leverage polarity intelligence, an essential competency for healthcare leaders, and the missing logic in healthcare so you can create healthy healing organizations and become a thriving, resilient, and unstoppable healthcare leader. We are your hosts, Tracy Christofferson and Michelle Troset. We've been best friends and colleagues for over 30 years. And during that time, we coached healthcare leaders across North America around how to create healthy healing organizations. Today, we coach healthcare leaders and leadership teams to live thriving, resilient, and balanced lives, combat burnout, and create the best places to give and receive care. This podcast is for the unsung hero of healthcare, the healthcare leader. We want you to know we see you and we'll be here for you each week. In this podcast, we're going to challenge healthcare's industry norms, flip limiting beliefs, and share proven strategies so you can be your best self at working at home, live and lead intentionally, and experience well-being and joy. We are glad you are here and look forward to sharing the journey with you. If you aren't totally convinced this podcast is for you, just listen to a few episodes and convince yourself. Well, hello, listeners out there. It is Michelle, and this is another episode of Healthcare's Missing Logic podcast. And right next to me is my BFF, Tracy. Yes, I am here with a BFO. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to give you a blinding flash of the obvious today. (laughs) That's right. It's a Valentine gift to you. Yep. It's all about love and we're giving you a love gift. That's right. That's right. Well, we did an incredible, Uh, another incredible interview. I know that'll be a surprise to all of our (laughs) listeners, but we spoke with David Emerald Womeldorf and he is an author of two incredible books that are definitely BFOs. They are. They give you a BFO. They do. They do. They're life changing, actually. (laughs) They're life changing. They are. Yeah. So, um, well, you get to hear a little bit about how David came into Tracy's life and then my life and then a lot of lives. And um, you'll get to hear something simple and profound and you're going to want to start changing. <laughs> <laughs> well, get the book because that will help. We highly recommend you purchase the two books. One is The Power of Ted and yes. the other is The Three Vital Questions, Transforming Workplace Drama. And we just have a lot of alignment with, yes. with um, David's work. And um, we've been using and practicing it for many years. And we will continue to practice it for many, many years, years because there's no end to this journey, right? Mm-hmm. It's an evolution of who you are. And, um, and it's just, it's very profound and yet so simple. Yeah. So simple and such a gift. It is a gift. It's been a gift to us and now we're gifting it to you. So from our hearts to yours. That's right. Tracy's going to tell you about David. Yes. Let me introduce David and then we'll get right to the interview. So David Emerald Wommeldorf is a co-founder of the Bainbridge Leader Leadership Center. And that's on Bainbridge Island in Washington. And he, as an author, is known as David Emerald, which he'll talk about. And he wrote The Power of Ted, The Empowerment Dynamic, which is a best-selling teaching story about self-leadership. And his latest book is Three Vital Questions, Transforming Workplace Drama. And that was published in 2019. And David's additional latest work is The Seven Commitments to Co-Creation. And that's a follow-up to the three vital questions and how to apply them in working with others. Now, David is a frequent presenter and facilitator on leadership topics, building collaboration and various applications of the three vital questions in TED frameworks. And then he draws from 30 years of experience in leadership and organizational development, including leading the former Bank One's Executive Education and Corporate Learning and Development. And he is also associated with the University of Notre Dame Stayer Center for Executive Education. Hmm. He's really a wonderful man. It was a wonderful interview, and we can't wait for you to listen to it. So without further ado, here's our interview with David. 
Welcome, David, to Healthcare's Missing Logic podcast. We are so, so happy to have you with us today. I'm excited yes, to be here. Yes, we are. Oh, it's great. It's just great. And we know that you are, you reign from the Pacific Northwest. And so we want to know from you what you love most about that part of the country. Well, um, I love the, the culture. I love the environment. I'm originally from the, uh, the Midwest, from Ohio specifically. And one of the things I love about the environment here is that, although I do think climate is changing somewhat, is that winters tend to be more mild and summers tend to be more mild. And there is green all, uh, all year round, even though there's uh, uh, enough changing of the colors in the fall for it to, to feel a, a bit like home. And, um, you know, as it relates to there being green all the way, uh, all year round, uh, as I was sharing with you uh, before we started the recording, um, I decided uh, very early on for a variety of reasons to take on a pen name. And uh, with my real last name being Wommeldorf, I was told that that was a bit of a mouthful, and it, and it is, and, and uh, have grown up with that. And as uh, we were considering pen names, uh, it was pointed out to me that uh, the Seattle, uh, the Seattle is known as the Emerald City, and uh, with my uh, adopted home of 20 years now, uh, decided to use that as the pen name, and that's where David Emerald uh, originated from. Is my love of the Pacific Northwest? Yeah, it is so beautiful there. My daughter mm -hmm. lived in North Bend for a ah. number of years, and we had mm -hmm. the opportunity to be there in the winter and in the summer it is just so beautiful i mean really if you if anybody of our listeners have never been to the pacific northwest it's a must do absolutely put it on your bucket list that's right and don't let the uh the the well there's a myth and a reality around rain um and mm -hmm. yes this time of year is actually the rainy season but as you know having been out here in the summer when there, when the, the clouds go away, you've got mountains to the east, mountains to the west, you've got the Puget Sound. It is absolutely magical. Mm -hmm. It is very magical, very magical. Well, we can't wait to start this interview and talk to you about your two books. They resonated with us so profoundly. Um, the Power of Ted and the Three Vital Questions, Transforming Workplace Drama. And uh, there's just a lot of reasons <laughs> why this resonates with us, right? <clears throat> but really, um, you know, TED, or the power, mm -hmm. the empowerment dynamic, being written from a personal, individual perspective. And then, of course, the three vital questions, more of a, an organizational perspective. Right. You know, we also have two frameworks that we work with. Uh, the dynamic balance effect framework mm -hmm. and then our healthy healing organization framework, right? And they're both very aligned and interconnected like yours are. And, uh, and so that was one of the things, yeah, that resonated with us. And so we want to share a little bit about both of the books in our interview with you today. And we're going to start with The Power of Ted. Um, and uh, this was and continues to be <laughs> quite a transformational framework for the two of us. And... I was introduced to this. Okay, now this is my Bible, The Power of Ted, <laughs> right? The, the original uh -huh. cover. The original the edition, original the original version, cover. Mm -hmm. The original, yeah. 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 And I got that from a mutual acquaintance, Molly Gordon. She was my coach at the time. Mm -hmm. And as we would have weekly calls, you know, she would bring this book up occasionally, talking about different things. Well, then, you know, she kept telling me, you need to get the book. You should get the mm. book. You should get the book. And finally, it showed up at my house. Now, when it showed up at my house, I knew she was serious and that this was something I really had to pay That's attention right. to. That's right. Knock, 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 Tracy. Yeah. Hey, knock out of your head, right? <laughs> How many times do I have to give you the message, right? And I mean, I just saw myself in the whole book, right? Mm -hmm. Like, especially in the dreaded drama triangle and how this was playing out in my life. And then I had an opportunity to attend a conference in Seattle with Molly and you were putting it on. Really, right. it was like workshop around the empowerment dynamic. So yes. I feel very blessed and it's been oh. a powerhouse in my life ever since. And I've shared it with many people. 
<laughs> as well. Yep. Um, and we like to say, you know, we, we don't do drama anymore, right? <laughs> well, we try not to. <laughs> I, I was going to say good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? That's why I'm still writing. I still look at it almost every day, right? Like, it's a practice, uh, right? It it's a practice. And so let's just start with what inspired you to write the book in the first place, yeah. David? Well, um, Tracy, be before I answer that question, I just want to uh, say from the get-go that I, too, am working with this all the time. And just mm -hmm. because I wrote the book and just because I've been blessed with uh, some of the insights that, that I will share with you, it really is a lifelong journey and a lifelong practice. <sighs> and uh, to me, it's entering into a master relationship with this way of thinking and relating and taking action. And I can't imagine there ever being a time when I would say I have mastery over life experiences. So uh, to me, it's mastery with rather than uh, mastery over. So uh, I'll give you kind of the medium uh, story answer to your question of the, the inspiration. And in the, uh, in the, the 10th anniversary edition, which is the latest edition of the book, uh, there is a, a version of what I call the story behind the story, which is an answer to your question. Mm -hmm. And um, the reality is, so a, a little bit, I know we'll talk about the frameworks in, in a few minutes, but a little bit of background for listeners on the book itself. As you kind of indicated, it is a fable on what I call self-leadership. And in the book, the primary character named David, no accident, um, was facing... Uh, three life events, um, and it was that uh, the, the, the passing of his father, um, he and his wife at the time were trying to start a family um, and uh, found out that he was medically infertile, and as a result of that, his marriage dissolved. Those are all part of my life experience. I don't even want to count the years now, but probably 25 years ago. And all those three things happened to me all in a, an 18 month period. And as a result of going through those challengers or those challenges at that time in my life, I started working with a therapist, um, which I'm a big fan of. And that's how I first got introduced to the drama triangle, the Cartman drama triangle. And, and its roles, we'll say more about it, but its roles of victim, persecutor and rescuer. And when I first learned about that, it truly was, and what I refer to in the, the power of Ted is a, a blinding flash of the obvious, meaning it was like, oh, this so explains so much of, of my life experience. And I had been working with the, the therapist for, I don't know, three, four months. And one morning I was engaged in what I call my morning quiet time, uh, which has over the years been ebbing and flowing combination of uh, meditation, uh, prayer, contemplation, journaling, etc. And I was in a very uh, contemplative space and I said a little prayer to the God of my understanding. I said, okay, God, I'm ready to surrender my victim stance in the world, but I need to know what the opposite of victim is. And I don't know what I expected, but immediately the word creator just popped in my mind. And um, I can't say I heard a voice, but I can see, uh, looking back on an experience, I can see why some people would say they heard a voice. And it was so stark. I had my eyes closed at the time. My eyes kind of flew open. And it was like, wow, I don't know what I expected, but I didn't expect that. And I wish I could say, to, to use a little, uh, if I can, a little, a little Christian metaphor, I wish I could say, like, Paul on the road to Damascus, my life was forever changed. And um, and that's not true. Um, uh, I can I would from time to time think about, uh, well, if if creator is the opposite of victim, is there an opposite to the persecutor and rescuer roles? And I would think about it sometimes. I'd do some journaling. And then, frankly, I would set it aside and it would fade in the background, sometimes for a good couple of years. And now, in a sense, fast forward to about, um, well, gosh, coming up on, time flies, coming up on about 20 years ago, um, I had moved to the Pacific Northwest. I met uh, Donna, who's my wife and business partner, and um, uh, and who was also a client of Molly's, by the way. Uh, 
<laughs> and I had moved to the Pacific Northwest and unpacking one day, I came across a journal where I played around with alternative triangles. And uh, part of my professional background is an association with an uh, organization called the Leadership Circle, which is a, a 360 degree feedback process. And uh, I come across this alternate triangle and a couple months later, I was at the University of Notre Dame where I would conduct uh, feedback sessions around this feedback process. And a um, gentleman sat down with me. And at one point in our conversation, he said, he said, you know, people come into my office and they're just such victims. And because I had revisited the triangle, I thought, hmm, I wonder if this would be useful. And so I got up on the whiteboard and I shared with them the, the alternate triangle, uh, which had a little bit different um, labels, which again, we'll get into here in just a moment uh, at the time. But uh, the next day I was at the little South Bend, Indiana airport and I called Donna and she said, how'd your coaching sessions go? And I said, well, I had this one really incredible one. And I told her uh, quite a bit about this particular feedback session. And she said to me, is that original work? And I said, oh, no, the drama triangle has been around for years. She said, no, 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 the, the other triangle. And I said, well, I guess so, because I, I hadn't even shared it with her. I said, I guess so, just something I've <laughs> thought about off and on for years. And she, I have to credit her. She is the one that said, this could be really helpful to people. You've got to write this down. And then one other little piece, I realize it's a bit of a story, but another piece I'll tell you is that when I first started then taking seriously the, the writing of the book, I thought I was going to write a, um, you know, a, a left brain because I do have an organization development, leadership development background. I thought I'd write mm -hmm. a, you know, a traditional nonfiction uh, kind of organizational book. And it was really uh, the woman who became my editor and book consultant that um, once I named the actual triangle, because I didn't have a name for the triangle, uh, and uh, realized that it was an empowerment dynamic and came up with the, the, uh, uh, the acronym of the empowerment dynamic, which is TED, uh, she's the one that said, ah, now you have, I love this word, by the way, she said, you have anthropomorphized the concept, meaning you've taken a concept she said, you can now turn it into a person and I want you to write a story. So that's a long answer to your question, but it was a, a series of, of inspirations. I uh, feel very blessed to have had that original epiphany. And then um, a lot of credit to Donna for the encouragement to actually uh, write about it. Well, and I think it just yeah. shows, you know, it was a process and things come over time Yes, and you weren't going to get to that, that the, the empowerment dynamic without the things that happened in between probably, right? Like everything Absolutely. contributes over time. So it was just, it was the right time for it to come. Yeah, forth. It was the right time and, I, and I had to live into it. Um, yeah, rather, exactly. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. If you would have forced it, right initially really tried to force it you it probably wouldn't be as strong as it is today so well, i appreciate grateful that, for that. And, and i absolutely agree with it and again it is a lifelong process so i had to to accumulate my own experiences some of which were not all that mm -hmm. pleasant and um and it gave me the the basis for being able to um to think through and we could spend, frankly, the, the our whole conversation of <laughs> sharing with you some of the magical moments in the process of actually writing it, uh, because some mm -hmm. things just emerged that I could not have figured out. Yeah. And I just love a fable format. Yeah, I do. I, do too. I love reading those books. Yeah, I do, too. It's just it's an easy read and you mm -hmm. can just it's so relatable. Thanks, Michelle. No, it's just really relatable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, we think that your framework um, of flipping from the dreaded drama triangle to the empowerment dynamic, TED, is absolutely gold. Mm -hmm. Like Tracy said, we use it all the time. Um, and in fact, we did a podcast episode on it, episode 110. Tracy and I talked about how to recognize when you're playing the victim role and shift to the creator role. But there's so, there's so much you can do with it. There's so much depth. And so can you just explain to our listeners the different elements of both models, the dreaded drama triangle and the TED? Sure. 
Well, as I already mentioned, the the three roles make up the drama triangle. In the book, I call it the mm-hmm. dreaded drama triangle, and hence I love acronyms. DDT, which, as you may know, is a a toxic chemical, so it yeah. is indicative of the <laughs> the toxic nature of the interplay between the victim, persecutor, and rescuer roles. So, just very briefly, in order to be a victim, one must have a persecutor, and but and Dr. Cartman. Uh, who I've had the pleasure of meeting and having quite a few conversations with, when he first articulated the drama triangle, it was purely in the realm of interpersonal dynamics. And what I would say, and, and what ha- what I have added to it, is that the persecutor does not have to be a person. It could be a health condition. It could be a circumstance, a, a situation like a natural disaster. Um, but in order to be a victim, one must have a persecutor. And then the third role that completes that dynamic is the rescuer. And the rescuer also does not have to be a person. It could be, uh, frankly, it could be an addiction. It could be anything that helps the uh, or allows the, the victim who's feeling powerless or helpless to numb out from their sense of, of, of victimization. And the rescuer can show up in one of three ways. Either the victim goes looking for a rescuer or uh, very often someone will intervene and out of being well-intentioned, will intervene into the dynamic between the victim and persecutor and say, I either have to fix the victim or I need to protect the victim from the persecutor. Um, And then the third way is that sometimes there is what I call a hoped for rescuer. And that's where the victim can't uh, doesn't immediately identify a rescuer. So a very mundane example: you're driving down the the interstate and some jerk pass, you know cuts you off. How many of us uh, hope that there's going to be a highway patrol person across, around the next bend that's going to to pull them over? So again, the 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 roles are victim, persecutor, and rescuer. With the fundamental shift from victim to creator, the rather than um, uh, reacting to the persecutor, whether it's a person, condition, or circumstance, as a creator, we have the capacity, sometimes easier said than done, to see that person or situation as what I call a challenger. And challengers are those people and situations that call forth learning and growth. And so the antidote to the DDT, to the toxic DDT role of persecutor, is the role of challenger. And then the helping role in the empowerment dynamic, which is the antidote to the role of rescuer, is the role of coach. And this does not have to be a, a professional coach. Um, but as a coach, we actually come from a space of seeing the person that we're supporting as a creator in their own right. And rather than um, seeing them as someone who needs to be fixed or taken care of, we leave the power with them, the power of choice to discern uh, what they want to create, uh, what they're currently um, experiencing in their current realities, and also committing to and taking what I call baby step actions in service to the outcomes that they want to create. So the the corresponding roles to victim, persecutor, rescuer are the roles of creator, challenger, and coach. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, I am a creator. I am a creator. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I'm a coach. I'm a talenter. There you go. <laughs> well, you know, for me, I uh, I learned about the the triangle prior to meeting you, David, mm-hmm. and Tracy introducing it to me. Um, but I again, I think the difference was it just came alive in your book and the fable, and then. Um, and so it's, it just it makes it so um, relatable. It helps you can look at it from your own um, situations, I think, pretty easy. And we know it's one thing to read about something, but it's another thing to actually apply it to your life. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we want to know what's been most helpful for the people that you've been engaged with since you wrote The Power of Ted mm-hmm. to embrace and actually actualize the empowerment dynamic in their life. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Uh, two things that, that occur to me. Um, I think the, the bottom line and where I'll start with is I think the thing that's been most helpful f- for people is to realize that ultimately they have a choice, that they are at choice. 
And um, choice really is, to me, the watchword of being a creator. And one of the examples that I use actually in both books, because it's been an inspirational example to me uh, and uh, and is a fairly widely known example, is that of uh, Viktor Frankl, who, um, mm -hmm. as a young psychiatrist, uh, was interred in actually, I think it was either two or three different Nazi concentration camps. And in the midst of that horrific exper experience, he came to the realization that even in that harsh reality, he had the choice as to how he would respond. And that became his life work uh, because uh, he, he, did, uh, he was able to live through that experience. So I would say, you know, if I had the bottom line, it's all about choice. And then the second thing that comes to mind is that, and I'm just so eternally grateful again for the, the epiphany that I shared with you earlier, is that uh, as I was starting to really do some background research that led to the book, there's been a lot written over the years around the drama triangle itself. So you said, Michelle, that you, yeah. you were familiar with the drama triangle prior to. And, um, and yet what I found was that a lot had been written. A lot of people, some people changed some of the labels. Don't need to get into that. But basically what I found was that um, the writings would say, well, now that you know about the, the triangle, just don't do it anymore. <laughs> and um, and so I feel very fortunate that I had an epiphany about there being another place to go in terms of um, because just saying stop doing something is not sufficient to to replace it or to uh, to transform it or to transcend it. And um, and just a, a little bit of a story. Very fortunate that that I reached out to uh, to Dr. Cartman when uh tracing the book that you have um that uh and and asked him for an endorsement and initially he said oh no you don't you, you don't need my endorsement um this will stand on its own and um i thanked him and about uh, a month later he reached out to me and said you know i thought more about your request and uh he, he's a he's a wonderful um uh, and somewhat eccentric um, psychiatrist. And he said, he said, I don't know what a dynamic is, but if you'll let me call it the empowerment triangle, um, I'd be happy to uh, offer a little bit of an endorsement because as uh, is on the, the cover of that book, he said that the empowerment triangle is the most effective escape from the drama triangle that he had ever seen. And I was very touched yeah. by that. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, I, I would agree, too, because I think it's the awareness. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think until you're aware, you can't you don't even know you're making a choice. You bet. Right. <laughs> like because it's so subconscious, yeah. like this, is, we're indoctrinated with these thoughts and behaviors and beliefs and it all just piles on. Right. And I think that's what's so powerful about it. It's like opening a door to say like you and you reading this fable and you're like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> there I am right there on the page. Right. And, um, it's that fine, you know, that, yeah. uh, blinding flash of the obvious. I just love that because that's exactly what it's like a smack in the head. Like, yep. Yep. Yeah, Duh, right. no wonder I'm experienced, but, but to your point, then there's nowhere to go. Like right. you, you don't just, you can't just stop. And the other thing is once you're aware, you got to keep doing the work, right? Yes. As we alluded to earlier, you got to keep it in front of you. You got to be conscious about it. Right. And I think I was doing this yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. be a creator, Tracy, be a creator. Don't get into the victim. You know? And you just got to keep reminding yourself that this is what you want. This is what you want, right? right? And keep shifting your perspective. But Well, and Tracy, that was, so actually what you're alluding to is, to me, is the unlocking move, if you will, which is to be able to catch yourself and to ask mm -hmm. the question, what do I want? Or if you're in relationship with others, whether it's personally or in the workplace, what is it that we want? And um, as I know you both know, answering that question of what do I want or what do we want is often more easily asked than answered and may really take some work to discern what the outcome is because we are so indoctrinated 
to focus on what we don't want and what we don't like and to react to those things that we don't want and we don't like. So to be able to pause and take a deep breath and to choose is really, again, is the unlocking move. And I want to, again, stress that it's a lifelong practice. So as long as the, uh, uh, the ratio, if you will, is two steps up to one step back, you're making progress. Exactly. Exactly. Just keep swimming. (laughs) (laughs) Well, then in 2019, now you wrote this other book, right? Like, so the three vital questions, and this is workplace drama, which, oh my gosh, who hasn't experienced that, right? And, um, and we just loved how you incorporated the Ted right into that, just kind of, it was like watching a flower blossom, right? Mm -hmm. Like you kind of, it was just really, really, really cool. So well done. Yes. So well done. And, um, so let's have you speak a little bit about the costs of drama in the workplace sure. and just just talk a little bit about that. So. Sure. Um, so the, the book does open with, uh, especially in the introduction, because uh, to your point, it is uh, put in the context of uh, an organization. Again, it's uh, a fable that takes place in an organization. And it, it does include everything that uh, in terms of the ways of thinking, the ways of relating, uh, the ways of taking action that are in the power of Ted. But the language I use is that it transcends and includes everything that's in the power of Ted. And the um, it opens with a, a perspective around both the cost of drama and the challenge of change. And, and I did some research around the estimated cost of drama in organizations. And uh, good old Gallup did uh, some research, and they estimated that the, the cost of drama in organizations just in the U.S., and I don't have the figure, frankly, on the top of my mind, but it's billions, B as in boy, billions and billions of dollars. Uh, Another uh, piece of research that I came across that has, frankly, has had even more impact for me is that it's been estimated that managers, leaders, and organizations spend up to 40% of their time, somewhere between 20 to 40% of their time, dealing with drama. And again, It doesn't have to be heart-wrenching drama, but disagreements, um, uh, various forms of drama. And somebody pointed out to me at one point that if you take the 40% figure and you think about the traditional um, notion of a 40-hour work week, that would mean, uh, so a manager that's spending 40% of their time is spending two days out of the week dealing with drama. And so, uh, you know, as much as uh, I appreciate your your comment earlier about we don't do drama, the, the reality <laughs> is that uh, when you have people working together, there's going to be some level of drama. But if we could reduce that two days a week to one day a week, if we could uh, redirect that energy and that time to uh, our clients, to um, other stakeholders, uh, just what that would free up and what that would do to our sense of, of fulfillment and satisfaction in our work lives. Yeah. Well, and we're working a lot with healthcare leaders right now. And I can tell you in healthcare, there's a lot of drama. No right now. kidding. Yes, and I is. bet it's about 75% yes. of their time, if not greater, is spent in drama just because of the COVID pandemic and everything you that's bet. happening. And yeah, the, the amount of burnout in that industry is just tremendous. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's getting worse every day. Yeah. So mm-hmm. yeah. This is, you know, it, it's it's high, it's just a high cost. Um then you also and you talk about your approach, you know, using this in work organizations. Can you share a little bit about how you can apply this in an organization? Like what's an example of that? Um, yeah, so a couple things that, that come to mind. One is I want to speak just very briefly about what I call the challenge of change. And, mm-hmm. um, and a number of years, a couple, good two or three decades ago. Uh, so I've spent about 40% of my career inside organizations and the rest uh, outside as a, as a consultant and as a, a coach, et cetera. And I share that because when I was um, inside, I was with a, a major bank in the Midwest for a number of years in executive education. And I went to a workshop one day and one of the presenters was a guy named, uh, uh, David, oh gosh, he's blocked on his last name, but from the University of Michigan's um, 
uh, business school, and he had done a study of studies around the effectiveness of change in organizations. And what he found was that somewhere on the order of 80% of change efforts fail to produce their intended results. Now, there's a range of failure. It could be anywhere from crash and burn to it took longer, didn't have the returns we had thought, uh, et cetera. But it really caused me to step back and, and ponder what's at the root of uh, or what's contributing to that poor success rate. And I came across a, um, an early article by Peter Senge, who went on to write a, a wonderful book called the, uh, around the, the idea of the learning organization and the fifth discipline. And in this article, it was in the, uh, the Journal of Quality Improvement, I think it was, he put forward a way of thinking about organizations that I'll briefly explain, and then I'll share with you the aha. Uh, so what he said is any organization, so that you can think about your healthcare clients, think about, um, frankly, any organization, there are really three dimensions of work, and he just called them A, B, and C. So the A dimension is the the production and or delivery of products and services. It's what the organization provides to customers. It's what it does day in and day out. The B dimension of work is the is made up of the systems, processes, and structures. In other words, how do we organize to get that A dimension of work uh, complete? And uh, he went on to say that there, there is a C dimension of work that happens whether we are aware of it or not, whether it's conscious or not. And that is the set of assumptions and the mental models that we uh, that we have that inform how we organize to get the work done. I'll give you a really quick example. So there's a classic theory from the 1940s, a guy named uh, McGregor, who put forward what he called Theory X and Theory Y. Theory X has a set of assumptions, which is the C dimension, that people are basically lazy they come to work primarily to get a paycheck and they'll do the least amount of work um, necessary to get that paycheck. Well, if that is the, the assumption, you can think about the, the systems and processes are gonna be controlling, um, you know, kind of policing, looking over people. He said, on the other hand, there's what he called theory Y, which has as a set of assumptions that people wanna make a difference, that they are intrinsically motivated they want to be a part of, uh, of something. And if that's the C dimension assumptions, you're going to have a much different set of uh, systems, processes, and structures to get the work done. That's going to be more empowering. Could be things as simple as employee suggestion systems, et cetera. The reason why I wanted to share that is my aha, and it's been the basis of my work for a good quarter century as it relates to change in organizations is that most change methodologies are focused on the B dimension of work. Let's just reorganize, let's just restructure. Um, and if we don't do the C dimension of work, we truly run the risk of, I'll use two, two metaphors here, of, of rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic or to be even <laughs> more mundane, as a colleague of mine once said, you know, all we're doing is pushing soap around the tub. That yeah. we're, we're yeah. not really changing the, the, the way we think and the way that we think about relating and the kinds of actions that we take. And that really is the basis of the three vital questions, is that yeah. C dimension of work. Well, I can say that's what we've seen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For 20 plus years. Yes. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I think we've experienced both. And so that's why it's so clear to us. We've seen the sure. investment that some healthcare organizations have made. And we were there to coach them on that C element. And we've seen many that that didn't do that. And mm -hmm. the outcome was moving the chairs around mm -hmm. and a lot of wasted time, money and resources. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, let's talk about the three vital questions next sure. then, David. You, you describe um, your three vital questions. Um, you know, you related it to the dimension C, but it's what you call change leadership and what it's all about. And what are the three vital questions? Sure. Well, Drum the, roll. The, yeah. <laughs> 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 well, the, 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 the three vital, the first of the three vital questions is where are you putting your focus? 
And are you mm -hmm. focusing on problems or are you focusing on outcomes? And that gets into the mental models and uh, what I call FISB. Uh, and the idea of FISB is that we fo what we focus on engages an interstate, which then drives behavior. So if our focus is on problems, our interstate is anxiety-based and our behavior is reactive in nature. Whereas if we can, again, pause and focus on outcomes and what it is that we want to create, and if we care about that outcome, it's going to engage some level of passion, uh, caring about that outcome, which then gives us the energy to engage in uh, what I call baby step behaviors in service to creating those outcomes. So the first vital question, again, is, um, is where are you putting your focus? And that sets the context for the second vital question, which is how are you relating? How are you relating to others? How are you relating to your experience? What's going on around you? And frankly, how are you relating to yourself? And are you relating in ways that produce or perpetuate drama? Which is what's going to happen if you're, uh, if the first vital question is problem focused, or are you relating in ways that empower others and yourself to be more resourceful, resilient, and innovative? And so, um, that, uh, as we've already talked about in terms of the DDT and TED, that's what the second vital question is all about. And um, with DDT being rooted in the, uh, the problem-focused reactive uh, mindset, whereas the empowerment dynamic really flourishes in an outcome-oriented, passion-based environment. And then the third vital question is what actions are you taking? And are you merely reacting to the problems of the moment, which is what happens in that problem orientation, or are you taking creative and generative action, including the solving of problems in service to the outcome? And, and that last piece is really important because the, this is not Pollyannish stuff. And, and some people think that it's, um, it's all soft stuff. And frankly, it is soft in that it's focused on the human side of organizations. Um, but we solve problems all the time in service to outcomes. And uh, so I, I don't want um, to paint an overly rosy picture. And in some ways, in some ways, the empowerment dynamic can be harder work than TED because in the, the problem orientation, we're letting the situation around us determine what we're gonna react to and, and where we're gonna put our time and energy. Whereas in the outcome orientation or what I, I call in both books, a creator orientation, uh, we often don't know if what we want to create is possible. And we saw we have to solve sometimes some really tough, challenging problems in service to those outcomes. So I think it's really important to to, uh, to emphasize that. So again, where are you putting your focus? How are you relating? And what actions are you taking? Those are the three vital questions. And vital they are. Yeah, <laughs> they are. They're so thought provoking, right? They are, you know, and it's, and yet they're simple. It's not yeah. like, whoa, like this big, long list, you know? Yeah. Well, it's enough to, again, bring that awareness. Yeah. Yeah. What am I doing? Right. What am I thinking? Where am I putting my attention? And how do I relate to everything that's happening around me? And to your point, when you're looking at it on the personal level, it's, maybe not as complex as it gets when you're looking at it within an organ because it's not just you you're working with other people you're working with the team you're working across departments or whatever it might be yeah. that's where the complexity comes in where there's you know that control aspect right i can control my behavior <laughs> well and and yeah. a, a couple of phrases that we use a lot is that um these questions and the uh, the power of ted is it's simple, but not easy. And um, a quote that I love that comes from Molly uh, Gordon is that she made the observation early on. She said, Ted is utterly simple and endlessly nuanced. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So true. It is. So true. Well, as we said, there's a lot of reasons, oh my gosh, right, that this resonates with us and the work that we're doing. And um, and, you know, just this dynamic tension 
And, you know, in the work that we do, there's dynamic tension as well between interrelated pairs, interdependent pairs, which are polarities that you have to manage. Right. And you really want to leverage that tension. You bet. Uh, it's not about eliminating it because you need the tension to motivate you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right, to advance towards what you want, right? So you want to leverage it. Um, and we know you have the dynamic tension, right, between the outcome, the reality, and then leveraging that by taking the steps, right? Taking baby steps. Right. Um, can you give our listeners a couple of examples of how that might come into play or um, show up yeah. in the workplace? Uh, I appreciate the question because the, the reality is that, that if you step back and really think about and really look at it, we create anything a baby step at a time. Now, a baby step might involve at times, if we're lucky, a quantum leap and a, and a breakthrough, but we really create a baby step at a time. And actually, as we are having this conversation, so I'm going to give you a real live example that has been alive um, in our experience the last several months, especially. So to give you quick context, we have a community of practice of about 120 uh, certified three by questions trainers. And tomorrow the, the, we are talking on a Monday, tomorrow and Wednesday, so Tuesday and Wednesday. We are having a two-day um, virtual summit that has all been planned by uh, by the community uh, with, with our involvement and input, but really planned by the, the community. And in starting the planning, one of the things that we emphasize over and over and over again in our work is that you always, always start with an outcome. And what is the outcome that we want to create? And in this case, there were three themes of inspire, engage, and expand, and some definitions around those, those three themes. So really spending some time up front in terms of what's the outcome that we want. And then the current realities over the last few months is um, you know, a process for, uh, for people in the community to uh, put forward breakout sessions that they wanted to, to create and uh, how we're gonna manage plenary sessions. And there were weekly meetings of uh, re really three different primary groups and just a lot of baby steps. And, um, and one of the things about baby steps is they're not always forward progress. This is one of the reasons why this is really alive for me is that I think it was two weeks ago, one of the primary people in the planning and one of the uh, a person who was going to be doing a breakout session had a family tragedy. And she mm -hmm. had to withdraw from the summit. And so sometimes a baby step is a step back. That's the reason why I bring this up. And mm -hmm. somebody else in the community kind of stepped up and said, well, I can do this, uh, a breakout session. Um, and then just last week, we had another member of the planning committee also have a, uh, a personal issue that came up in her immediate family. And she needed to step back. And, uh, and we were able to come up with, um, frankly, kind of a more of an open space conversation that's gonna happen on the second day. So I'm sharing that with you to say, we started with an outcome, tons of baby steps to get to, I've uh, got a good old rubber band here, I'll use the, so this is the idea <laughs> of dynamic tension. So we started with the outcome, yep. and then it was just a baby step at a time. And some of those baby steps or some of the things that happened, we had to step back and and even in the times where it's a step back, the, the power of focusing on outcomes is not to be overstated because in both cases of the situation I'm sharing with you, uh, before we came up with alternative actions, it's like, okay, let's remember what the outcome is that we're going after. And does this possible baby step align with that outcome? rather than just reacting to the both of those situations uh, out of a sense of anxiety. So yeah. Uh, yeah. that's an example. And then on a very everyday mundane uh, example, um, well, I'll use this conversation. Uh, the, the two of you planned for this conversation. You knew what kind of outcome that you wanted for this conversation. You did your homework. Um, you uh, helped prepare me uh, as part of the baby steps. And now we're having this conversation, kind of a, a question and interaction at a time. That's dynamic tension uh, in action. So those mm -hmm. are a couple of examples of one that was more macro, one that's more 
um, I don't want to say every day because you guys do a lot of work for your podcast, but um, uh, one that's real practical and, and uh, mm -hmm. real alive mm -hmm. in this conversation. Yeah. 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 Great it is. examples. It is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've always appreciated the concept of dynamic tension and the fact that tension wants to be released. And that's what we want to do, right? We want to release that tension. And I, so I've always just, I always keep that in my mind, right? Is just because you run into a problem or a barrier or you have to take a detour doesn't mean you have to let go of the outcome that you want, you, you know, to relieve the tension. You want to keep the tension because that's what's going to get you back on track yeah. or what that's what's going to motivate you to find another solution. So in your example, rather than going up, oh, well, we got to fold that. Now we don't have anybody to talk like, you know, just letting go right. of filling that spot. You step back and say, wait a minute. OK, we still want this outcome. It's still possible. What's another alternative to it? And it just keeps you in the game. You're so yeah. right. And, and attribution is really important to me. So I, I do want to uh, to say that what I call dynamic tension is based on the work of Robert Fritz, who called it structural or uh, and then as he partnered with Peter Senge, called it creative tension. Um, and and you're absolutely right, Tracy, the, the easiest thing we can do when things are not going well is to compromise the vision is to I'm going to go back to the rubber band is to settle for something yep. less than what it is that we really want. And the reality, as a good friend of mine, Bob Anderson, says, we can't invest our souls in a compromise. We know that's when right. we are compromising that that vision. Um, yeah. But that's the easiest way to yeah. react when, because I think it's important to to um, consider that the the dynamic tension is the creative energy and the creative process, and creating outcomes is not anxiety free. And there are times where we can experience the anxiety. And if we react to the anxiety, then we're going to find ourselves in that problem reactive orientation. But if we can have the anxiety without the anxiety having us, and we say, okay, I'm feeling anxious. Okay, what are the possible next steps? That's how we continue to leverage the tension, even though we're still feeling some anxiety. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and so often that anxiety is you're just stepping out of your comfort zone, right? You so bet. you got to go for it. You can't, I mean, <laughs> that's just going to happen. Your body's going to try to, your mind's going to try to keep you safe, right? You got to just go, nah, that's I'm, right. I'm on my way. <laughs> yeah. Keep well, moving. and that's, um, it, it, it's so connected to our work around polarity intelligence, David, because mm -hmm. just to keep on with your example, um, we want an outcome for this podcast episode to be awesome you know it just want to bring it the message to our listeners and it and so it involves a two different pairs of planning and implementing mm -hmm. and you t you have to take baby steps on both sides of the of of those and so it, we really do identify with the whole creative mm -hmm. tension and why yeah. that's so important yeah absolutely yeah so um okay now david it's time for the missing questions ah <laughs> so they were missing from the planning, so you don't know what they are. <laughs> That's true. We planned for them. We just didn't share them. We just didn't share them. Yeah, we planned for them. <laughs> uh, but you know, this is just a way for our listeners to get to know um, you as a person, different parts about you. And so we have a couple of fun questions. Nothing that you know you can't answer and have fun with. <laughs> And then we have a wrap up question. So okay. that's how we're going to close our interview today. All right. Our first question is, what is one place on your bucket list that you have never been to yet? Ah, New Zealand. Oh, oh great uh, choice. Yeah. Um, I, my, uh, my, one of my stepdaughters and her now husband uh, spent a month there and uh, just, raved about it and i know it's a very environmentally conscious country and uh i've been to australia but i've not been to new zealand so that's on my bucket list mm. mine too i've been to australia and haven't been to new zealand so. i haven't been either so <laughs> i gotta catch up <laughs> oh okay and um another question is what is your favorite season and why ah actually that's also easy um fall and um, ah. having grown, it's the one season that I uh, actually do miss from the Midwest. 
because that yeah. the the colors, the crisp air. I'm a big football fan. There's just something about the about the fall, and it, I love fall here in the Pacific Northwest. But it's not as crisp. It's not as colorful. Again, I still get the greenery all, at, during the winter, which is a, a really important trade-off. But it's a bonus. <laughs> uh, the, the fall, autumn is my favorite season. Yeah. Well. We can relate here yeah. in Michigan, right? We, yeah. We've yeah. just had all that. Now now we got snow. So <laughs> <laughs> that I can do without. <clears throat> anyway, we got one more question for you. Yeah. So as you know, you know, we're working with healthcare leaders to help them develop a competency in polarity intelligence. And one thing that polarity intelligence teaches us really is that, you know, we all have a preference poll. We may be able to appreciate you know, both poles in a polarity, but we tend to have a preference for one more than the other. It's just a natural thing. Right. Um, and so we wanted to ask you what your preference is, teaching or learning? Who? What comes up for me and not from an egoic standpoint is teaching because in teaching I learn. Um, mm -hmm. and so to me, the, the two as in our, any polarity are so, uh, interwoven. Um, but because, uh, to kind of come full circle to where we started some of this conversation, it's a lifelong process. So I'm, I feel really blessed to get to teach this stuff and, um, I'm learning it every day and in teaching, I learn a lot. Well, wow, what a great answer. That is a great answer. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how I feel too, right? I love teaching, but I also, one of my strengths is learning, you know, mm -hmm. and I think you get, it, it is a polarity. That's why you get a little bit of both in mm -hmm. each. Yeah. So. That's so true. They're definitely interrelated. Yes. Oh gosh. Well, this has just been wonderful. Awesome. Um, I've had a great time. And I just want, I, I have two, I have two. And I, I recently read the three vital questions. Um, I read that in preparation for the podcast episode. And while we've been using the, you know, the TED, the empowerment dynamic in our work and working mm -hmm. with healthcare leaders, uh, to what I said earlier, I loved how you embedded it into the three vital questions for organizations. And I said to Tracy, it was just such a gift to me again. <laughs> um, so... I just want our listeners to know what the whole point of this is something that is ongoing. It never leaves you. And I just, it brought up a whole new appreciation for me in reading your latest book. And um, I think today you've explained it beautifully to our listeners. And I'm very appreciative of that, of that as well. Yeah. And, and I think too, you know, as entrepreneurs, we've got a growing company. I think it's just, you know, a great way for us to think about our culture yes. and how we can incorporate this into our culture, share it with our employees and really start our growing company out in a very positive way. And it just complements a lot of what we already do and believe. Um, but I also think, you know, what you said towards the end about we can't invest our souls in a compromise. I see people doing that every single day. And to me, that's why this is so important. It's yeah. just critically important that we pause, that we really think about what is the outcome that I want and am I settling and compromising my life um, because of the choices that I'm making. Right. And, and I think too, it's wherever you are is where you're meant to be, mm -hmm. but to gain the awareness to make the shifts that you you know you can make to have the life you want. To me, that's what this is all about. That's about the work that we're doing as well. Is just trying to right. open up the possibilities, help people see their their leadership and their lives mm -hmm. in a different way, and move it forward. And I think that's just the power of your books. And so, oh, thank, thank you. you and for amen to all here. that you just said. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. it's wonderful. Great interview. Woo. All right. I'm energized. <laughs> Woo, let's go. <laughs> well, Michelle, Tracy, thank right, you so well, much. Yeah. 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 We've enjoyed it, David. And for our listeners, that's another wrap for Healthcare's Missing Logic podcast. And we'll see you next time. Stay safe and take care. Bye-bye. Be the creator in you. Be the creator in you. <laughs> you 
enjoyed this episode of Healthcare's Missing Logic podcast, now a top-rated podcast for healthcare leaders. Please share this podcast with other healthcare leaders and anyone else you think would benefit. We are certain that if you found value in it, they will too. If you haven't already done so, please hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any episodes. And also, it would mean the world to us if you took a quick moment to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast player. It helps to get the word out about our podcast and incredible guests. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to watch our podcasts. You can also follow us on our Missing Logic social media channels, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Until next time.